Okay, as I was saying, thank you very much for the invitation. You've organized another wonderful meeting and uh, really happy to be here. Um, so uh, this is Yale's uh, logo. Uh, you know what that means here? Light and truth. And so we're going to find some truth from, by using light in photosynthesis. Uh, um, what, I, what I want to tell you about today are a little bit changing gears. So we've uh, talked a lot about uh, the mechanism of water oxidation. And although I work on that, you heard some of the things that we do on that together with Victor Batista yesterday when Victor gave his talk. So I thought I'd talk about uh, some of the second shell residues, the hydrogen bonding network surrounding the oxygen evolving complex. And also, uh, we've heard a bit about uh, several people arguing why they don't like our model for ammonia binding. So I thought maybe in fairness, I'd say why we think this model is OK and uh, give you our po point of view on that. Um, I should point out this is a very collaborative project. Uh, so we work very closely with Victor Batista, who does computational modeling, um, Rick Debus, who is in the audience here. Uh, there's Rick over there. And he uh, generates the mutagenesis, uh, site-directed mutations, and also does FTIR measurements that are uh, co uh, in conjunction with the experiments we do. And also uh, Jiming Wang, who helps us with crystallographic analysis. Um, and so as I go along, I'll be, be including all it, it, um, work from all three of them. So this is uh, Jim's structure. Uh, and uh, this, th actually, there's a milestone here for us. This has uh, inspired me to talk to Victor Batista and said, can we use computational modeling to help refine the structure of the oxygen evolving complex based on your, your, your uh, way, publication? 1.9 angstrom structure at the top of it in terms of, you wouldn't see much. It's pretty same. Yeah. So the um, po point I want to make here, however, is that the oxygen evolving complex is this cluster of ma four manganese and uh, calcium. And it's very far removed from the aqueous phase. And so in order to turn over, you have to move water in quite a significant distance. And protons and electrons and oxygen have to be, um, be leaving. And protons, in particular, have to migrate to the aqueous phase. And that requires a network of hydrogen bonds. Protons don't go long distances like electrons can. And so we, we're interested in those hydrogen bonding networks and how they might um, transport protons. I have to confess, however, that we are not anywhere close to the sophistication of the cytochrome oxidase people who all know all these you know, K channels and D channels and things in exquisite detail. We're sort of still sorting this out. Um, so here's a, a, a picture of some of them. Um, th this is uh, a picture that was generated by, uh, by Leslie Vogt um, based on a QMMM model of the structure. And it, these little spheres are water molecules that are modeled in using QMMM methods. And they, they largely um, reflect the channels that had been identified uh, by a number of other people, including James Murray and, and Jim had, had identified some of those. And these channels have been descriptively labeled large, narrow, and broad. Um, we're, we, we, we sort of know what they're, what they're, some aspects of them, but we don't really know all the details of what they're doing yet. Um, it's been, uh, I think, the, uh, believe that the broad channel, which is the start of it is this aspartic residue 61, is involved in proton release, um, although there are alternate pictures or proposals on that. Um, the narrow channel here is believed to be how waters move in. Uh, one interesting aspect, it's narrow and it's not enough uh, um, uh, size to accommodate water to be fully hydrogen bonded. And it's also containing relatively hydrophobic um, residues. So the water is sort of forced to follow a pathway in because the hydrogen bonds that it have are the ones to the ones next to it. And so when one uh, is used in, in the reaction to make oxygen, you know, others are going to be following. So it provides perhaps a mechanism to ensure water moves in the right direction. Um, so what we've been uh, doing is working with Rick uh, to probe some of these second shell amino acids that are in these channels to try to identify you know, what is their role? And uh, so the, here's, you know, the number of them are labeled here. Uh, this is the Spartac 61, which we think might be the start of the proton exit channel. Um, there's a number of other ones. Uh, I'll focus on a couple of those. But what we've been interested in is using a ver various methods, such as uh, measuring the yields of oxygen and kinetics of oxygen formation, uh, pH dependence, isotope effects, and also chemical residue experiments to try to interrogate are these pathways functioning in proton transport, where you might expect, for example, HD isotope effects or um, effects on uh, using chemical rescue experiments that could help 
alleviate a, a pathway that's blocked for proton transfer, um, or are they substrate channel um, pathways that might not show the same behavior? So um, one of the one of the uh, um, aspects of, of photosystem two that's very interesting is that the residues around the oxygen bombing complex are incredibly highly conserved. And so Leslie Volk did a, uh, an analysis of the gene sequences. So it turns out the oxygen evolving cluster is at the interface of three subunits, the, the D1 subunit, um, the CP43 subunit, and the D2 subunit. You can see some of these residues, the D2 residues, D1 residues, and CP43 residues. Uh, so she took a, a sector of the, of the protein that includes O3 polypeptides and analyzed the variation amongst all the sequences, and quite a large number of sequences from cyanobacteria and algae and, and higher plants, and it turns out that there's only one non-conservative change in, uh, among all of them. Uh, it's amazing. You know, it, that's especially amazing since cyanobacteria or bacteria in plants are eukaryotes, and they diverged about a billion years ago. So there's been about a billion years of divergence and evolution, and nonetheless, all of them still are basically the same. Uh, and, and, but one of the ones that was a non-conservative difference is this D1N87 residue where most cyanobacteria have an asparagine residue, um, and green, all, the, all green plants have an alanine. And so we were interested, okay, let's turn cyanobacteria into a green plant and see what, it, you know, what, what, what happens. So Rick made this uh, substitution of, uh, in Sinica cystis, substituting the um, uh, alanine for the asparagine residue. And the interesting thing is there didn't seem initially to be much of a phenotype. It would grow photosynthetically, um, when we were purifying the protein and trying to do some assays, it didn't really look like there was any difference. So the question, why, why is this always alanine in green plants and asparagine in most cyanobacteria? <coughs> and then um, uh, uh, Gorob did this, I don't know why he did it, but he did an experiment to, to, to assay it in, in, a, in a buffer that had low, very low chloride concentration. And chloride, of course, is a required um, cofactor for water oxidation. So if you remove chloride, it's not active. But Sinica cystis uh, binds chloride, and also in a bacteria um, that I'm aware of, bind chloride very tightly. So if you compare the activity in high chloride 60 millimolar here versus a tenth millimolar, um, there's almost all of the activity is retained because it's just because it doesn't come out. It's very highly uh, tightly bound. On the other hand, if you look at spinach PS2 membranes, um, you lose over half of the activity if you assay it, and this is immediately, uh, um, you lose the activity um, in 10th millimolar chloride. And what we found was that if we made the alanine mutation, it turned it into a spinach PS2 in terms of its affinity for chloride, whereas the, um, uh, the um, uh, glutamic acid uh, substitution didn't change. So the chloride um, function didn't change. And so th that's quite interesting because if you look at the position of this residue, here's the, the D1N87, and here's chloride over here. They're not that close together. There's a significant distance, about 10 more than 10 angstroms, and uh, suggesting that there's a very um, uh, tight hydrogen bonding network that propagates this change, the, the difference being that the N87 residue could participate in hydrogen bonding and alanine not. Um, over to the chloride and affecting somehow the affinity for chloride. So this not, we're not completely clear how that is, but this is kind of an interesting result and it just got published just about two weeks ago in uh, JBC. So that's uh, you know, one aspect, but b by and large, everything else is the same. And so um, but before I move on to some of the others though, the question comes up, okay, wh what is chloride doing? So it's uh, just to, to point out here, the chloride is here, um, it's forming an ion pair with this uh, lysine 317, and it's pretty close to the aspartic 61, which I mentioned is believed to be involved in as proton, uh, a proton acceptor. Um, so if you take chloride out, it doesn't work. Um, and we were interested in why doesn't it work in a chloride depleted sample. Um, so this is some molecular dynamics uh, calculations that Ivan Re Revolta did. This was published a fairly long time ago. And so if you look at, um, a sample with chloride, here's the uh, spartic 61 residue, here's chloride forming an ion pair with lysine, and these, water, these circles are water molecules that are moving around, but they form a, a very good network to mediate uh, through per, perhaps a growthless mechanism proton transfer. Whereas if you take chloride out, what you see is that this, um, now the lysine has no compensated charge, and that causes the spartic residue to move over to form an ion pair, 
and it blocks this pathway for protons or waters to form, and we would then are, uh, uh, conclude that this now blocks proton transfer. So we think chloride is playing an important role to modulate proton transfer, pro, uh, proton release in photosystem two. And another interesting aspect of the molecular dynamics calculations is that this is the crystallographic position of chloride, but in the molecular dynamics calculation or simulation, um, it moves to two different, there's another position it can in an opt. And we think that might be an indication of its function because if it moves, it's changing the electrostatic environment of this aspartic residue. And you may be possible that you could gate somehow protons being favored to release or not by uh, electrostatic modulation. So this is something we're thinking about for chloride, although its exact function isn't particularly, is completely clear, but it does seem to be playing a role in, in proton, proton release. Okay, let's come back to the second shell residues now. Um, and I'm gonna focus on two of them uh, that we've looked at. We've, uh, we have looked at a number of the other ones, but I'm gonna focus on this lysine 317, which is near the chloride and also near the pathway that we think proton release might be occurring, and compare it to the serine-169 residue. Um, the reason we're interested in this residue is that this side chain is hydrogen bonded to this water molecule, WX, and that's the water molecule that disappears in Shen's structure when you go from the S1 to S3 state, and that we've suggested may be involved in the carousel mechanism of water moving in, and this water is at the narrow channel, of the, which is believed to be the substrate delivery pathway. So with that kind of background, we might suspect that there's a, a function in proton transport in uh, the lysine residue, and uh, water uh, delivery in the with the serine residue. So here's some results on the, just the uh, serine 169 alanine mutant. Um, you can, this is uh, looking at uh, oxygen yields as a function of flash, and you see uh, the characteristic period four oscillation, and it's damped out much more in the serine mutant. You, you can model this, and there's a very large increase in the miss factor in this mutant. So it's not working. Um, and one of the things we've looked at is a proton inventory curve. So this is now looking at the uh, um, steady state uh, hydrogen deuterium rate, relative rates in, in H2O versus D2O, as a, as a function of mole fraction of, of D, uh, H2O versus D2O. So all H2O versus all D2O. And the, these kind of curves tell you how protons are involved in the, the uh, rate determining step. And for example, if you have a linear behavior, which is this one is pretty close to linear, that's an indication there's one proton involved in the rate determining step. And if you see these kind of uh, convex or uh, concave plots, it indicates more complex um, behavior. And I'm not we haven't really analyzed the, chem the shapes or how it, what it's telling us about mechanism in any detail. But just a qualitative comparison, this is looking at the serine mutant, this is the wild type, and this is the, uh, um, the lysine mutant. And you can see qualitatively different behavior of the lysine mutant compared to the serine mutant. The serine mutant looks more or less similar to wild type, and that would suggest that the HD isotope effect or the rate determining step is not changing by this mutant the, the, for, for the steady state um, oxygen evolution, whereas this is very different. And so uh, it, we also see similar behavior or differences if we look at the kinetic solvent isotope effects. So it's just looking at the HD isotope effect as in steady state turnover. The wild type is about one and a half, and you see quite a kind of similar uh, number for the serine mutant and <coughs> significantly uh, bigger value in the lysine mutant. And so I'm, uh, I, I don't want to go into a lot of detail, but the, the conclusion that we can make from this is that the serine mutant doesn't seem to be involved in proton uh, transport. Um, it doesn't show the same HD isotope effect behavior, pretty much doesn't change from wild type. And so that we suggest might be because it's functioning in water delivery. Whereas the lysine mutant shows much different behavior for HD isotope effects, which we suggest might be because it's playing a role in the proton transfer path and when it's mutated, we're messing up proton tr transport. And that's the origin of its impaired function. Okay, so that's a little bit about what we've been doing, um, and I want to spend maybe the rest of the, uh, my time before questions uh, addressing the question, the topic that's come up already is how are the substrates bound, and as many people have already said, um, 
th there are actually nine waters as ligands to the, to the metal centers, five neooxo ligands and four terminal water ligands, and as well as a, a, a many more that surround this in a hydrogen bonding network. And, and all of these are potential candidates for the substrate, um, not only the ligands, but also some of the second shell ligands, uh, or waters as well, could, could be substrates. Um, and, and of course, this is very relevant to the mechanisms, which some mechanisms have proposed, muoxos as bridges as, as um, substrate, uh, by how the substrates are bound, others terminal ligands, and some mechanisms, even second shell waters, are proposed as the substrates. Um, so I want to take you a little bit through some of the S-state uh, models that we have for both the S1, S2, and S2, S3, and, and how we've used uh, ammonia as a substrate analog. So as, 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 as other people have said, the S1 to S2 transition is special compared to the others. It, it, it's the only uh, S-state transition that occurs at low temperature, down to 100 Kelvin. And it's uh, a transition that does not involve a, a proton release. Uh, at least not to the aqueous phase, uh, and there seems to be the very little structural change. And, um, but it also is interesting based on its EPR, because as you've heard, there are two EPR forms. There's a high spin uh, form, S equal five halves form, that gives a signal at G equals four, and then a multi-line form that gives a signal at G equals two from a spin one half state. And these have been modeled in terms of the, this closed cubane and open cubane structures. This is just showing some QMMM models that were generated by, uh, by Misha Skirka and Victor Batista's group, but the original suggestion came from the Mohan group about um, these two structures where we have um, uh, 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 the oxygen five being either uh, associated more closely with manganese one or with manganese four. And the issue here is interesting from an inorganic chemistry perspective because if you look at this structure as sort of this cartoon picture, you've got two manganese three ions and the S1 to S2 transition involves a manganese 3 to 4 oxidation. Now, this oxygen is sitting on a Jan Teller axis for both of those manganese ions, which means it's going to be quite a long bond. That's not because it's a weak ligand. It's just that that's what it's on a Jan Teller axis. And so it's by virtue of seeing a long bond here, it's not telling you there's any particular significance to that oxygen. It's just that it's that positioned on a Jan Teller axis. However, if you oxidize manganese 3 to manganese 4, now it becomes symmetrical. There's no Jan Teller distortion in manganese 4. And one of, whichever manganese is oxidized is going to own that oxo. It's going to move close. And so if mang the dangler manganese is oxidized, it moves this direction and creates an open cubane. And if the uh, manganese number 1 is oxidized, it moves over here and becomes a closed cubane. That's just a reflection of coronation chemistry. This is, uh, this is what you'd expect. But the interesting thing is that these two manganese, manganese 4 and, and manganese 1, have very similar um, reduction potentials. So there's oftentimes an equilibrium of the two forms, and very small changes can actually switch the equilibrium to favor one or the other. You can see in this kind of sample, this is a spinach PS2 sample, we see you know, comparable amounts or some amount of both of them. And for example, depleting chloride will shift it more to favor the G4 form and other, other conditions will shift it to favor more of the multiline form. For example, cyanobacteria. Uh, in the wild type, at least, you don't see any of the G4 form. It's entirely the spin one half form, but there are mutations that you can make or substitutions that will shifted in that direction. So the energetics are quite close to e uh, e equal for these two, and they can shift it one way or the other. Um, now in the S2 to S3 transition, um, this is a transition that there's a structure change that's been um, attributed to a water binding event. And this is also a step that involves proton and electron transfer. So it's a PCET step which is, as we've heard uh, you know, very nicely from you know, Tony's talk about how PCET can help to uh, ensure that the reduction potentials don't get so much higher and uh, that the potentials for S1 to S2 and S2 to S3 aren't very different. Um, so we're interested, in, we're interested in ammonia to, as a substrate analog. And there's been a kind of a checkered history. So this was something that was studied in the 80s uh, from Sandusky and Yoakum did steady state kinetic experiments. And then Warren Beck and Julia DePaula in my group did EPR spectroscopy. And, and the, the EPR experiments uh, showed that there were two binding types of bindings. There was a, a binding that occurred in the S1 state that is competitive with chloride and it binds outside the OEC. It's kind of an interesting 
behavior because ammonia and chloride aren't not chemically very different to, from, to each other. They're, they're very chi chemically different to each other. And it led to the suggestion at that time that chloride must be a manganese ligand because they're both Lewis bases and you'd think they might be ligands. That turns out not to be the case. Um, and, and then when you oxidize the S1 state to the S2 state, ammonia now moves to bind directly to the manganese. And this was something Warren Beck discovered um, in, in about 1986. And uh, this is not a competitive, competitive with chloride. It, it's specific for ammonia. The, uh, other amines do not bind in this, in this way. And, and, and this, so this was interesting and it was the question then is, is ammonia behaving like a substrate analog? Is oxidation of the manganese cluster triggering the binding of a substrate molecule? Um, uh, so th this is just some showing the EPR spectrum, spectral changes that were observed. But then it was found uh, later, uh, I think there was a nice paper by Alan Busak and then more recent exchange kinetics by, um, by um, Johannes uh, uh, Messenger showing that ammonia doesn't significantly per perturb the substrate uh, exchange kinetics. So that led to the conclusion that probably ammonia must, must not be a substrate analog. And I never really liked that uh, idea because ammonia and water are isoelectronic. Why shouldn't they behave chemically in analogous ways? And that led, uh, led us to reinvestigate that. So David Vineyard uh, did some studies on how ammonia is, is uh, affecting the, the, the system. And these were now um, looking at flash oxygen yields. And w in, a, in a flash oxygen experiment, we can uh, analyze them to determine misses. What we see is that the misses in ammonia-treated sample are significantly higher, so it's not non-perturbing. It is affecting the, the, the system. But also, very interestingly, if you do a, a, a flash oxygen experiment where you vary the spacing between flashes, you can determine the lifetime of the S state. And this is what's done here, looking at the delay time versus the yield uh, and use of oxygen after you complete the cycle. And you see that ammonia is decaying slower. So it's stabilizing the S2 state. Um, what David did was to set up a kinetic model uh, looking at the forward and recombination reactions. Many of the rates of these steps were known. And then we modeled in with and without ammonia. This, was a, this is a simulation of the data. And the conclusion from that uh, is that the ammonia is stabilizing the S2 state by greater than 120 millivolts. So it's significantly uh, stabilizing it against recombination. Now, why is that of interest to us? Well, different ligands coordinating to a metal cluster affect their reduction potential based on their, their donor characteristics. So you have strong donor ligands that's gonna make the complexes uh, you know, easier to oxidize and less donor ligands gonna be more oxidizing. And, and you can quantify this based on uh, a, a table of parameters that Barry Lever put together. These are called Lever parameters, where you could then estimate the contribution of one ligand for, to the reduction potential. And so from those parameters, you can calculate or estimate how much the potential should change if you substituted ammonia for water. And the prediction is 30 millivolts. And so we're way, way beyond 30 millivolts here. So that led us to conclude this cannot be a reaction where we're simply substituting ammonia for water, which is the proposal that we heard everybody said that's what they like. Um, doesn't explain this result. Um, and so that led us to suggest that it's binding as an additional ligand. And the reason for that is that now with an additional ligand, you have more electron donor um, uh, mobility, and it's going to stabilize the oxidation state, the, the S2 state more. And this would fit with the increase in, in uh, the stabilization of the S2 state. And so this led uh, then uh, Victor Batista's group to start modeling the structure of the um, S2 state with ammonia. Um, th this is a model of the, uh, the chloride com competitive site, the so-called site 2, which is uh, binding in a second shell position uh, right here next to Spartac 61. Um, pulling the, hy the hydrogen bonding network over this direction more in, a, in such a way that it excludes the binding of chloride. And so lysine now becomes more associated with, um, with the aspartic acid as a result of the hydrogen bonding shifting. And so it does account for the competitive binding of ammonia and chloride. It also, um, this, uh, this ammonia, uh, which is binding as a neutral ammonia, actually steals a proton from W1, a ligand, so it becomes an ammonium ion in the bond form. And that, ex that is consistent with the observation by Noguchi that it, it seems to be binding as an ammonium ion based on FTIR. Then if we look at the 
um, S to, uh, uh, the, the, the bound form. This is right adjacent to the dangler manganese here. And so the suggestion is that the binding of ammonia directly to manganese is then triggered by this migration over to a bound, uh, binding to manganese 4. Uh, th this structure was, was optimized not only based on uh, th that, that behavior, but also to fit spectroscopic data, particularly um, XAPS data that Holger Dow had published uh, earlier on the ammonia derivative. And so this was consistent with that. And this structure is one in which ammonia is binding as an additional ligand, stabilizing the oxidation of this dangler manganese so that this would be manganese 4. Um, the manganese 1 then is, is the one that's manganese 3. And that, that idea then was that we were binding and, uh, ammonia and the other ligands were then rotating in this direction. So we hypothesized then that this was analogous to water binding. So it was binding as a substrate analog and that led us to suggest that the water that comes in and binds in the S3 state binds in this way, causing this rotation of ligands around. And that led us to the car this, this carousel mechanism where water binds, the others rotate around and creates a structure where we have an additional water bound here, but this water is, is actually coming from the, the rotation of the pre-existing waters. And so in this way, we think ammonia is binding exactly as a substrate analog, but this is not the water that is actually generating oxygen in the, uh, in the, uh, the next step. And so in that way, you can rationalize ammonia as a, as a water analog and the fact that it doesn't block the, uh, the substrate uh, exchange. Um, is this fitting? And so this is work we, um, from, from uh, Shen's lab, which we heard about already. Uh, Victor Batista mentioned this. Um, this, this is now a, um, a, a, a difference Fourier map of the, comparing the S3 uh, and S1 states. And what we see is a disappearance of electron density here, which is at the WX position, and the appearance of electron density within the cluster. And this is exactly what we predicted in the carousel mechanism, that this water just would move over and bind and uh, rotating around. So this really was completely consistent with the idea that we had pr pr published earlier of, from, of, of the carousel mechanism. And so the, this QMM model of the S3 state, we think, is, is consistent with the, both the X-ray crystallographic data from XFEL studies, as well as the uh, XAFs data that had been published earlier, and suggests that water's binding during the S3 to S2 to S3 transition as a sixth ligand, completing the octahedral coordination of manganese force and, and, um, and enabling this to, to uh, rearrange in, in this way. I think the, the final structure that we, we've, we've modeled here is actually in fairly good agreement amongst all the computational groups. It's quite similar to models that have been proposed earlier, from, for example, from Per Sigbon's, Sigbon's group. That, uh, there are still some different proposals as to how water moves around, but the fact that the XFEL results really fit with this carousel mechanism lends support to that, to that idea. Okay, so is this ammonia binding as an additional ligand? Too long, okay, I'm just my last slide. Is this ammonia binding as an additional six ligand um, something that we can provide further experimental support for? So these are some high score experiments that we're doing with Lakshmi at RPI. So this is a two dimensional um, EPR, uh, pulsed EPR experiment. And we're looking at the S2 state of untreated PS2 and what you see are five um, high, um, proton hyperfine couplings. And in this high score experiment, they looked at sort of these ridges and they're labeled H1 through H5. This has pre previously been published and it's proposed to be coordinated water ligands or um, other, other protons in the, in the immediate vicinity. And what we see in the ammonia treated sample is that none of these disappear. So the two um, hyperfine couplings attributed to coordinated, wa coordinated water molecules remain. And in addition, we see two new hyperfine couplings which we attribute to the coordinated ammonia. So the conclusion here is that it adds as an additional ligand, we see new hyperfine couplings that uh, were not present prior to the ammonia treatment and we don't lose the, the hyperfine couplings that are assigned to water ligands. So I think this is now an argument in favor of the addition of ammonia as a sixth ligand as opposed to substituting it for one of the, 
uh, one, one of the two waters on, on manganese. And so with that, um, let me just, uh, the conclusion is that it binds us an additional ligand. Let me just end by thanking everybody, uh, particularly, the, I've mentioned the students and postdocs in my group, and Victor Batista and some of the collaborators, and thanks for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions. <laughs> Uh, thank, um, uh, the microphone over here. Um, <coughs> thank you very much, uh, Gary. It's a, a, a fascinating uh, talk. Uh, now, are there any questions now? Uh, can you look after? Oh, good, good. Thanks. I was wondering uh, two things. One is basically, have you ever um, uh, mod uh, modeled the, the um, ammonia modified uh, S2 multiline signal? Uh, this is, I mean, with your structure that you propose, where you have that extra ammonia bound uh, in the S2 state, and the oxygen 5 is kind of in a very strange position in the middle somewhere. Yeah, yeah. This is coming from the QMM modeling. Um, and, you know, one of the things that Dave Britt raised is the question of whether this structure fits with the manganese hyperfine couplings. Exactly. That's and also and so question. that's what yes. you're leading to, yeah, I'm sure. Exactly. And, and um, one of the things we're, we're, we're doing right now is simulating those uh, using DFT methods. And we haven't done it, we haven't completely finished it for the ammonia derivative. Um, but we've gotten quite, I think, quite good results right now on the untreated sample. So we, we'll then take that structure that we modeled and see if it can model the the, um, the manganese hyperfine couplings, as well as the proton hyperfine couplings or other couplings. And mm -hmm. I think that's going to be another experimental test. If it doesn't fit perfectly, we're going to have to refine the model, of course. But that's where we're headed. Mm. And uh, for your carousel mechanism, um, basically, as I understand it, you, you have this ammonia binding that you propose that happens there. And uh, then you have kind of a final S3 state. but you. I haven't seen actually that you calculated the whole mechanism if it's energetically feasible uh, as compared to Dimitrios Montazis with the pivot mechanism. So uh, what's your take on that? Um, well, in terms of calculating a pathway for yeah, it. Yeah, if it's, yeah, yeah, it's really fe feasible energetically and so forth. Yeah, so that, that, yeah, that hasn't been done yet. But <coughs> but I, don't, um, I don't believe in the Batista group, but that's something we could work on. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, um, Holger first, and then you are okay. Yeah, it's, it's partially a comment. So uh, we have uh, investigated the ammonia effect and published last year in biochemistry. And I think one needs to take into account that it's possibly more complicated when interpreting spectroscopic data. So we find good evidence that there are kind of three relevant ammonia binding sites or two mostly re relevant. And one is inhibitory and the other one is non-inhibitory. And that the non-inhibitory site with presumably the site you are investigating, <coughs> is um, still coupled to changes in the FTR spectra if you go through the estate cycle. And the changes are, yeah, they say qualitatively in agreement with this carousel mechanism. So uh, <coughs> it's kind of supportive. But still, specifically regarding interpretation of the EPR data, I think one needs to take into account that it's not automatically ensured that you always bind to the same site uh, you have a single manganese associated ammonia binding site. So we interpreted it in a way that it's possible that the ammonia can bind either to W1 or to the W2 site, which might complicate, may or may not complicate to some extent, the uh, interpretation of EPR sites. I mean, Gary, Gary agrees that it would be binding to W1 or W2 down here, don't you? Uh, uh, ammonia? Well, actually, what we would suggest is it's not binding to either of those it sites. Bind it's, bind it it's binding to a new site, and the other yes, W1 and W2 are still there. Yes, yeah. yeah, but you wouldn't like that, of course, because that would just interfere with the whole chain of water molecules. Going yeah. To, it yeah. Everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, I have another view about that, but I'll, I'll wait till tomorrow. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for a nice talk. And I have a question about uh, carousel mechanism, regarding the carousel mechanism. Uh, it is based on an uh, assumption that uh, water molecule disappearance and the uh, uh, insertion of O6 occurs at the same time. But uh, if uh, water molecule disappearance occurs first, let's say S1 to S2, and then uh, O6 insertion occurs in S2 to S3, still that carousel mechanism is possible? Yeah, so actually I've talked with, about this with John Ren already, uh, and I. I 
uh, aware of some of the results. Um, one of the, the, the points I make is that there's no evidence of water uh, or structural changes in the S2 state, but it, there may be changes in, in, in order of water. So one of the things to be aware of when you're looking at electron densities is you won't see it if the water becomes mobile. Um, and so that might be what you would expect if you need to uh, coordinate it to the manganese cluster, move to coordinate to the manganese cluster, it can't be bound too strongly. And so that would suggest maybe it would not be as locked in position to be able to see the electron density. So that, that, would, be, that would be certainly true. And you don't see all of the, it by, by X-ray crystallography, you don't see nearly all the water molecules that are modeled in a QMM simulation. There's a lot more waters there than you see by crystallography. Okay, well, uh, sorry, we're going to have just one more question, and it, I'm, I'm sorry, and that will be from Peter Rich, of the time. Thank you. Gary, I was very interested in your simulation where you remove the chloride next to the lysine, and you end up with a sort of dehydration in that region, partly a removal. Well, it's just a, it's just, it's a position where the waters don't, don't move. They, yeah, it, it's not, you know, so that simulation, all those spheres were not all water simultaneously. It's where waters had been positioned over the course of that molecular dynamics trajectory. Uh, and they don't move through that region. So you basically have blocked the ability to form a, a, a complete oh, right. pathway. Right. I mean, the, the reason I find that in, interesting is because in, in the various types of simulations that we've been doing, I think others, that usually when, when you introduce a, an, a, an uncompensated charge somewhere, you usually recruit extra water molecules. I mean, that makes sense, you know, from a physical point of view. Um, and I just wonder what, in your case, uh, the, the chloride is charge compensating the charge lysine, presumably. Mm -hmm. So when you remove the chloride, are you left with a, an uncharged lysine? Or, or is the lysine uh, still charged? Are, well, are you generating a... Uh, yeah, so in this is something that Marilyn Gunner has looked at a bit with uh, her... Um, MCC, uh, um, what is it? Yeah. MCCE, well, well, <laughs> the question, the question, Monte Carlo calcula uh, electrostatic calculations. And yeah. the conclusion from that is that the lysine stays charged. It stays and, charged. and it forms an ion pair with the aspartic acid there next to it. Oh, right. Okay. okay.